My name is Jean Cho, and I'm the co-chair of the um, board for the Culinary uh, Literacy Center at the library here. Oh, we know people who know it. That's awesome. Um, it's the first program of its kind in any library in the U.S., and it's revolutionizing the way that Philadelphia's, Philadelphians are learning about food, nutrition, and literacy. Um, as many of you know, the uh, Free Library is dedicated to advancing literacy, guiding learning, and inspiring curiosity, um, from its award-winning author event series to thought-provoking programs such as the CLC's Edible Alphabet Program, a unique model that combines English language literacy instruction with hands-on experiential learning through cooking. Um, please consider making a gift to the library that will help it continue its transformative programming. This evening, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sam Sifton, who is the food editor at the New York Times and the founding editor of the digital cookbook at the Times, NYT Cooking, which I use at least every three or four days. Um, Sam Sifton is one of America's most popular culinary writers. He formerly worked at the Times as the national um, news editor, the restaurant critic, and the culture editor. He held numerous positions at the New York Press and is the author of Thanksgiving, How to Cook It Well. In his new cookbook that he'll be talking about today, See You on Sunday, Sam celebrates the art of Sunday supper and the pleasures of communal meals. We're so thrilled to have him here tonight. Please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Sam to the Free Library. Hey, hey! How's everybody doing? Thank you, chilly night in Philadelphia, and here we are. This is really an impre this is I, this is not a religious book, but I, I feel a little bit as if I'm going to be able to sermonize, and I'm pleased about that. Thank you very much uh, for coming out. Um, I'm going to let you know what's going to happen, and then it'll happen, and then we'll uh, go sign some books, which is painful but joyous for me. The wrist, but the joy. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, that was a lovely introduction, and, and thank you for it. Um, but I want to tell you, do you guys subscribe to the Times? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you subscribe to the What to Cook newsletter that I write? Yes. OK, so you know a little bit about me, about my quirks. Um, and um, I'd like to unpack that a little bit. Um, in part uh, to, to set the stage, as it, as it were, uh, for where this book came from, but also to kind of try to explain what it is that we're doing, that I'm doing at the Times, and, and why um, I dare to think it matters. So uh, I've been at the Times a long time. I got there in, in 2002, and like a lot of uh, journalists, um, I, I'm sort of on that ADD spectrum. I get bored and I want to move and do something else. I got issues with authority. And so I, I, I've, I've worked all, all over uh, the newspaper. But it is true. I came uh, to work on the arts desk and I ran arts coverage for a long time. And then I went to be the restaurant critic, which is a marvelous job that's extraordinarily difficult to complain about. But just watch. Um, I, I left the restaurant uh, job to be the national editor, running um, news coverage all around the nation in our 13 news bureaus that are outside of the metropolitan region, which for us includes New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, weirdly does not include Philadelphia, so close, um, and Washington, D.C., or at least the federal corridors of power in Washington, D.C. So I did that for a long time, and I'm going to stop there, um, in, I'm going to stop in that era of my career for a moment to say that in that job I traveled restlessly all across uh, the country and it will surprise perhaps no one in this room to discover that in some areas of the country the New York Times is not a well-loved newspaper. <laughs> but what was fascinating about uh, talking to people who, who really didn't know about or didn't see a distinction between our editorial board and our newsroom. Even in those conversations, I discovered that there were people who really liked our food coverage. You know, a guy would tell me how, you know, you're basically were like red diaper babies running a newsroom and ruining the country, but that Eric Asimov's pretty good on wine. <laughs> and I thought, 
that's interesting, and I would continue the conversation. I've always believed, I've worked, um, I've done reporting and, and criticism in the food space since my very first uh, paper. So I, I know the power of food to connect people, and I know that even if I'm talking to a recalcitrant Republican governor in a, um, in a, a Central American, U.S. American state, um, I, can, I can get a conversation going about food and we'll get to an interesting place really quickly. So a lot of these conversations that I would have would end up in a kitchen. And again and again in these kitchens, I noticed in the bookshelves the New York Times cookbook. Now, the New York Times cookbook was put together by one of my predecessors, Craig Claiborne, in the late 1960s, the early 1970s. And this was at a time when the New York Times was not an international newspaper with five million digital subscribers, which it is today. <laughs> it was uh, a local paper. You know, you had to wait two days to get it in Los Angeles. You had to wait a day to get it in Washington, practically. But Claiborne understood that maybe if he put together all these recipes that he had uh, collected and reported on around the United States, maybe people would be interested in them. And he put it into this book that was very plain. There are no photographs in it. There are no what we call top notes, no um, you know, beautiful pro, at least in my case, beautiful prose at the top of the recipe. It was just like beef bourguignon and here's the instructions. And this book was a national bestseller for the better part of a decade. So out there on the road as, nas as national editor, a marvelous job, a job that I treasured, but a job that is very high stress. The business of being national editor at the New York Times is the business of school shootings of weather events, of terrible accidents, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. And sitting in these hotel rooms, uh, having had difficult conversations, seen horrible things, but also having seen the New York Times cookbook, I wondered, would it be possible for us, for the New York Times, to capture that lightning in a bottle again? NYT cooking, is the result of that discussion between me and many, many people at the time, some of whom were supportive and some of whom were not so sure it was gonna work, but it has worked. Um, and I see in the collection of these recipes uh, in our digital archive, um, a chance to tell a story about America and about the world that is amazing and positive and rich uh, with both history and culture. So there's that going on in my life. And at the same time, I had spent a number of years, a lot of years, working as the restaurant critic, which, here comes the complaints, is a night job. I had a, I had a young family, and my young family wasn't coming with me when I was reviewing four-star restaurants in New York, nor was my wife, who pointed out when I said, this is a great restaurant, honey, let's go. And she's, I, she said, you don't come to my job. I'm not going to your job. Like, you have to work. And I said, huh. And that was true. I was, I, I, I was working. And, and I didn't quite know how to handle this um, as, a, as a good, or at least putatively good husband and, and father. How was, I, how was I gonna be a member of this family? And so when I was restaurant critic, I decided we're gonna have a hot breakfast every day. The kids will have a hot breakfast every day. We will eat together every day. And that was hard, because it's a night job. So there I was in my sunglasses, palming Advil and <laughs> making French toast before school. Very painful, difficult work. But it had its, uh, it was. Um, <laughs> I don't want French toast today. But we had this little family thing going. And then I would go back to, to, to work. And, and, and the business, we can talk about this later. We're going to spend, I'm going to rant for a little while, but then we're going to spend a lot of time answering your questions. Um, and you may have questions about the restaurant job. But the restaurant job, late night job, right? Six days a week, I had, six days a week I'm out at dinner, usually out at lunch as well. It's, see, it's, it's like death by massage. You're like, really? Again? Again with the foie gras? 
So what was I going to do on that last night, which usually was a Sunday night? If anyone has read uh, the late Anthony Bourdain's great book um, about Kitchen Confidential, you'll know that Sunday night is not generally the night you want to be going to a, a, a restaurant. So I would take Sunday nights off. And I would gather, I, I didn't often eat with close friends because I was working. I, and I also think that if you're going to spend the Salzburgers money, a lot of money on these restaurants, um, that it's probably a good idea to bring people um, from the, the paper, colleagues along with you and, and kind of lift the mood of the whole room, take some beleaguered business reporter and take him to Danielle for the night and he's pretty happy in the morning. So I was kind of trying to do my, do my work um, uh, for, the, for the paper and then I also had, the, I had need of particular kinds of guests. I wanted people who would draw focus from the guy who potentially was the restaurant critic for the New York Times. They're not sure. There weren't. There was like one picture of me out in the world, and there are a lot of bald white guys in New York City, and I think that's him, but I'm not sure. But if I had someone to draw focus at the table to 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 be the alpha, um, that was really helpful. And I have a few alphas in in my friend group, but what I really needed was like a whole battery of criminal defense attorneys. <laughs> Like, these guys are the best, and women. They are the greatest. They draw focus like mad. So I wanted to see my friends. I wanted to see my family, and not in the early morning hours when I was scrambling eggs. Um, and so uh, I, started these, I started to cook for family and friends. I missed cooking as well. So I would put these things together, and I realized... Some of you may know I wrote a book about Thanksgiving a number of years ago, my favorite holiday and a thing that I care about greatly. I realized that what I was doing on these, in these Sunday night dinners was putting together the same kind of energy and love that I tried to put into Thanksgiving. Not making it complicated, not throwing a dinner party, but simply having a kind of meal with friends and doing so regularly enough that they kind of knew that it was happening. They might even ask, is there dinner on Sunday? And, and that, to me, was revelatory and amazing and heartwarming, and I thought kind of important. Now, you remember, I started on the, on the arts desk. I started by editing uh, culture critics, and then I was a critic myself. And I, I realized that my philosophy of, of restaurant criticism is not simply a kind of quotidian, up, down, three stars, but you should go. There's great value in that. I think it's really important to be able to say these are the five best pizzerias in New York right now. But I wanted to write criticism that made an argument about the city that used restaurants in the same way that an uh, architecture critic would use a building um, to say something about who we are right now and, and what we uh, could be. Um, and it seemed possible all of a sudden there's this, you know, long subway rides in New York, you gotta think. And it seemed possible in my thoughts that maybe, um, maybe there might be a book in, in those Sunday dinners. And I had some pals who, who agreed with me, and one of them was very important to, to, the, to the coming together of this book. And his name is John Murs, and he's an Episcopal priest in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And I grew up with him in Brooklyn Heights. And as I say in the book, I grew up with him at a time when the literally last thing you could imagine John Murs becoming was an Episcopal priest. <laughs> he was a hard man, a child of the streets. Um, but he said, why don't you come? Why don't you come by on Sundays in, in the late afternoon? I do an evening prayer service. I mean, you could cook dinner after and people show, put a bunch of stuff in a pot, some rice, see how it goes. So we did that. And to that, I brought the family. And we saw that what I suspected might be true out of the experience of myself and, and my friends and family was true when it was strangers and neighbors. And to have a group of maybe 12, maybe 25, maybe 40 people, some of whom were homeless, some of whom were damaged, some of whom were the opposite, some of whom were 
big bustling families, some of whom were new to the city, some of whom had lived in the city their entire lives, to have them around a table eating a simple, and I dare say delicious, meal together um, was a kind of magical thing. And it, it, I said at the beginning, this isn't a sermon, this isn't a religious book, um, but maybe it's, there's something spiritual there, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it isn't spiritual, but it is religious, or maybe somewhere between uh, religion and spirituality, we have ritual. And in ritual, in service, in practice, um, we can find something magical. So that was the, the genesis uh, of the book. And um, this all happened all this stuff in my head happened while I was national editor. And um, in retrospect, it's insane to think that I could have written that book while being the national editor. Because I, I, had, I, had I had everything in front of me, but I simply didn't have the time to, to put it together. Because school shootings, weather events, terrible accidents, repeat. And so it wasn't until I got back to to the food desk to build NYT cooking that I was able to, to not to gain the time, because most of this book was written between four and seven in the morning, um, but at least the, the kind of perspective and headspace that would allow me to do it. And I believe very, very strongly um, that you may, I hope you love the recipes in this book, and I, I, I hope you love the words as well. But if you just take away the sentiment that it's a good thing to bring people together, to welcome strangers, neighbors, new people, always to have an extra um, uh, place at the table for the person who just happens to show up, your life's gonna be better. Their lives are gonna be better. And um, I, 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 hope that's, I hope that's the takeaway. Um, so look, here's the, this is what it looks like. This is the QVC portion of this particular presentation. This is, this is what the, the, the book um, looks like. And I thought I might, because I, we're already losing them. Um, I thought I might uh, read just a couple of things from it um, before uh, we engage in a conversation, because I'm looking forward to that conversation very much. Um, one of the things I, I'm gonna, I like to zag when I'm supposed to zig. And so one of the things I said at the beginning is that these dinners are not dinner parties, right? You don't have to have them on Sundays. I like Sundays because most people have to go to work on Mondays, and so no one's coming to your house thinking like it's gonna be a rager. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes you'd like to have a party, and it's not Thanksgiving, it's high summer, and you want to put something together that's a little bit different and make some magic. So this is from a chapter called A Nice Party. Not all these dinners I'm writing about need to be taken around a table indoors. It would be nice, for instance, to have one on a beach, a clam bake at sunset. It would be nice to have one in a field under live oak and Spanish moss with lanterns hanging from low branches, everyone picking at barbecued hog. How about lamb roasted over an open fire somewhere in a snowfield in Patagonia, everyone bundled in colorful blankets, stamping around in fur-lined boots? You've seen the spreads in glossy magazines, beautiful people in beautiful clothes, eating beautiful food in beautiful places. It would be nice occasionally to be like them, wouldn't it? It would. It's nice out there. I once helped Qualey Watson, a chef in San Antonio, smoke a goat and a couple of ducks in the garden of a grand home in the city's King William neighborhood for a meal he served to more than a dozen friends. And even if all we were doing was cooking up some food pornography for a magazine spread, and that is exactly what we were doing, there was still something astonishing about how the evening came together in a combination of laughter and deliciousness. We stood on the lawn drinking margaritas and dipping chips into his Tex-Asian version of queso, wrapping bits of goat in warm corn tortillas and adorning them with salsa and crema. And even those of us with male pattern baldness and rumpled khakis felt beautiful. 
part of something at once magical and real. Now, of course, most of us don't have access to a beach, to a field, to a redoubt in Argentina. Not all of us have friends with grand homes in uh, old neighborhoods, but there might be a park nearby. You might have a yard of some sort or an alleyway running beside the house, a sidewalk, a porch. Take advantage of these every once in a while. Cooking something delicious and serving it under the sky can confer beauty on all who are present, even when there's a sodium vapor streetlight playing the part of the moon and the stars. A bold menu helps. It makes a statement. That goat, for example, that lamb, those clams and lobsters and potatoes wrapped in canvas under the sand. Manny Howard, my oldest kitchen companion, came up with a great one, a fever dream of a meal for family and friends, first knocked out in a postage stamp concrete yard in South Brooklyn, later in driveways and gardens, a simple supper of oysters and fries. It was in some ways the simplest of endeavors. Manny opened oysters, regular as a metronome, served them with lemon, horseradish, and glasses of wine, a bushel of oysters, two bushels of oysters, more. I stood next to him and fried potatoes in a pot filled with gallons of peanut oil, pound after pound of them, each serving served, salted, and doused with malt vinegar and tonged into a small paper boat of the sort you can get at the restaurant supply shop, $10 a case. One year, someone brought along a dozen hot dogs for the kids. I fried those too, and the following year, I fried a lot more. <laughs> Rippers, some call them, for the way the heat breaks open the casing on the sausages, leaving them fragrant and crisp. And that was that. We served no salad, no side dishes, no dessert. And it soon became a tradition for the two of us sporadically to serve this project meal with an eccentric menu that just so happens to be fantastically great. One year, Manny got some hay bales for people to sit on. You could always add a keg of beer. We sure did. String some Christmas lights in a tree, invite that family with the instruments and the beautiful voices. Sunday suppers aren't really parties. I know their intent is simply communion with family and friends but sometimes a party is great and oysters, fries, and fried hot dogs make for a nice party indeed. <laughs> so that's who I am and that's what I write. You've read it in the newsletter. Here I am making this argument. It's culture, it's togetherness, it's everything. And we can talk, about, it's great. You can talk about books, you can talk about politics, except you shouldn't talk about politics. Repeat, repeat, repeat. That's what I'm doing. That's what this book makes an argument for. I really hope that you'll take a look at it, and I'd love to sign it if you do it. But let's have a conversation. We've got Tell us your feelings about dis dessert. I know you have a certain disdain for complicated dessert. I, I, I have no disdain for, for complicated desserts. I simply don't want to make complicated desserts. Um, I've spent a long time cooking the other thing. It's kind, don't you notice that people kind of divide between sweet and savory in their cooking? And there are people who are, who are bakers, and there are people who are out in the yard burning something. I'm that guy. Um, and I, um, and, and, and so it's complicated, right? I'm cooking a lot. I can't also make your galette, sorry. Um, uh, but I love a galette, and if you wanna make a galette and bring it on Sunday, I'd, I'd be overjoyed. That said, dessert matters, right? And, and there's something amazing about having a capstone on the meal. So if you don't have a friend or loved one who makes fantastic desserts who's going to and and you yourself are not um a a, a baker or you're not married and i'm definitely not married to a baker um what are you going to do well that pile of cut fruit is properly deployed with a, a fair degree of magic surrounding it um can be just amazing um there's a recipe in here this is, maybe this will lead you not to buy the book, but there is a recipe in here for a dessert I call Malamars and Milk. And it's super complicated. You serve a Malamar with a shot of milk. <laughs> now, true, true talk now, true talk. Many of us who haven't really had milk since we were kids have no idea that organic whole milk 
in a shot glass, really cold, is incredible. It's like, it's like a drug. <laughs> it, 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 it's, and the combination is just beyond. So I realize that makes me sound like I'm just a Philistine when it comes to dessert. I'm not. My peach pie is bonkers. I've got a, gr I, I really do, and if, if you want to fry the hot dogs, I'll make the peach pie. But I really like frying the hot dogs. So I, I have a question yes. about the New York Times cooking section or column. Okay. So I, I think I've been reading it since it started. And at some point, I started realizing, you started writing about books to recommend and ways to hang out and all the things you just talked about, the News Bureau, um, yep. national disasters, politics around the world, and it sort of sneaked up on me. It was really interesting, and then I started looking forward to it as much as I looked. It became actually my go-to sort of editorial page. Well, excellent. Uh, that so was the I'm, point I'm, all along. Yes, yeah, so I guess I want to know how that evolved, because well, I've never seen anything like that before. Well, good. Um, I'm, I'm, re I'm really glad that you noticed it, um, and I really love that it snuck up on you as if we introduced it slowly. Um, it's been there from the start. It was, there were two things that I cared about when we launched NYT Cooking. One was that we weren't gonna have comments on the recipes, only notes. And people are like, the, this amazing person, do you know the term, do you know what a product person is? Has this invaded your life? The product people, they're really invaluable and super important and they help make NYT Cooking as excellent as it is. The, user interface of it and the like. All the complicated stuff that we don't really understand but that makes a huge difference in whether you like it or don't like it. But occasionally they say things like, the words don't matter. And then, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Notes, comments, same thing. It's not the same thing. We, it, we, we're, we're signaling from the beginning that we don't, I don't, I don't need a comment from you. I need a note. It implies that you've cooked it, that you know something about it. Of course we have the people who are like, I don't like this. Or can, you know, is there a way to replace the mushrooms in that mushroom tart with something? I don't like mushrooms. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, beef. We put the mushrooms in there because, uh. Um, but in the main, it, in the main, those notes are really helpful and it's a very supportive community. So that was number one, notes, not comments. And number two was, I'm going to write about the world in which I live, and the world in which our readers live. And I'm going to write about the things that matter to us, which is above and beyond what we see in the, in the news pages. It's going to be what we're listening to, and what we're watching, and what we're reading, and what we're going to the museum to see. Because where do you talk about that? At the dinner table. So, the, the, and remember, I'm making this argument, it's culture. So I wanted there to be culture there from the beginning. And, and there were plenty of people who were like, um, that's mission creep. <laughs> was like, no, it isn't. It's the point from the very beginning. But it took a while for people to start noticing that it was there. And I really thought that there was going to be an uphill battle with a lot of mail to food editor at nytimes.com where it would be like, you know, stay in the kitchen. Um, and, <laughs> And, I, and I, I was ready for that. I, like on, I, I have a folder on my desktop and my laptop that says emails I have not sent. And um, <laughs> that, is, that is filled with answers to the people telling me to stay in the kitchen. Um, but those, but the, 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 there weren't as many as I thought there would be. In fact, quite the opposite. There were people who said, you know, I read about the recipes and I find one that I like, you know, it's great and thank you, but wow, I had never seen that Del McCrory performance or I can't believe you are recommending that novel or I've never seen that video. And um, I take great pride in, the, in, in that because I, I think it shows that the New York Times is doing more than simply uh, writing recipes for roast chicken. I think, um, because I think that what you do when you serve your friends and family on Sundays <laughs> and have a conversation with them, you're not, you're not talking about like the provenance of the bird. You're, you're, talking, you're talking about what, what's happening in the world. And as a corollary, you mentioned politics, but there are no politics in the What to Cook newsletters. 
Why? Because there is this giant wall between us and the editorial board. And I'm not in the business of having a political opinion within the world of NYT cooking or within the world of this book. What I am is a citizen of the world. And I understand that when horrible things happen in the world, people are going to have an emotional reaction to that, that food can help. And that's borne out in the numbers, by the way. It's, it, this is a horrifying uh, piece of data to, to share with you, but it, it's, it, it's kind of, it's amazing to me. When there is a, t a terrible event, a terrorist attack, um, uh, even the coronavirus, when something wrenching happens in the world, our numbers go up. Beef stew through the roof as a direct, I, I mean, causation, correlation, I don't know, but bad things happen, my numbers go up. That's, that's a great um, responsibility for us, and I want to acknowledge it in the, in the writing that I do. Everything. I've always wondered, um, as a cook, I use recipes kind of as a springboard. Sure. And I've always wondered how a cookbook author or um, claims a recipe, because it always feels to me like they're kind of, you're always moving on. That's true. There are only about 11 recipes in the whole world. <laughs> and that, that, that sounds funny, but it's also kind of true, right? There's the chicken. We can throw it in the fire. We can put it in water on top of the fire. We, like, what are you going to do? So um, how those recipes become something that I can give to you and that you can make your own is... It's pretty simply a matter of, A, um, expository writing, what the, what the instructions are and how clear they are and how much confidence they um, give you as, as a reader and, and cook. And B, increasingly in the modern age, that top note, that story that we tell. And there's a, if you follow recipe Twitter, <laughs> and I urge you not to, You'll see that there are people who are like, I don't want any of this falder all on the top with your story and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I understand where that's coming from, right? There are a lot of people who confuse um, uh, journalism with journaling, right? So I, I don't particularly want to hear this long stem winder of a tale about your great grandmother in Kiev and blah, 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 and it goes on and on. I want, to cook, I want to know whether I want to cook this thing. And when we write top notes, we are talking about um, where these recipes came from, the reporting that went into them, the development of them, why we think they're bulletproof. Um, and we're wrapping that all in what I hope is a kind of cloak of glittery words that excite you and get you to do it one time. And once you've done it and you get a good result, you may do it again. And then you may do it a third time. And if you do it a fourth time, that recipe is no longer the one that you read in the book. It's yours. It's changed in some way. Because you've made either intentionally or um, unintentionally changes in, in, in the preparation so that it's yours now. And in that sense, recipes are, are just sheet music. And they can be interpreted by the hack musician um, in, in loads and loads of, of, of different ways. And to experiment with this, I've started writing, and you may have seen them in the Wednesday newsletters, these no recipe recipes, which are just prompts. They don't tell you exact anything. They just kind of encourage you to combine um, ingredients in a particular way. And those have been strangely um, successful. And people say, it's really a recipe. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> um, food has become very visual. Yes. So Instagram, Great British Baking Show, et cetera. How has that visual emphasis changed cooking? Um, uh, it has cha it changed cooking, capital C, my world, or, or lowercase c, the world. I, it's sort of similar in both ways. Look, we talked about Craig Claiborne at the beginning of this discussion, and there were no photographs in, in, the, in the New York Times cookbook. In fact, Photographs didn't accompany uh, recipes for a very long time. In fact, until four color printing became cheap enough to do because black and white photography of food 
looks like prison food. You can't do anything about it. It's just, that's what it's gonna look like. So you needed the ability to transmit beautiful images, either uh, in four color printing or over your phone um, to start capitalizing on that particular form of food pornography. Um, what has happened be specifically because of Instagram is that some um, chefs and some recipe developers and even some newspapers have, um, have come up occasionally on purpose with recipes that are visually stunning um, and hopefully are also delicious that take off like mad on, on, on the internet with hashtag, you know, hashtag the stew. Does anyone know this Allison Roman recipe? Yeah. Okay, so it happens to be incredibly delicious, as most anything with two cans of coconut milk would be. Um, it, it, it is absolutely, and it's stunningly beautiful. And if you look through Instagram, you'll see picture after picture after picture after picture where the stew, hashtag the stew, um, looks just like the one we published. And we get calls all the time from people who are like, you really have to check out, you got to check out this um, Conby in Los Angeles. They've got this amazing egg salad sandwich. We want the recipe and here's what it looks like. And what it looks like is every picture of it that you see on Instagram. Now we have that recipe on NYTimes.com and you can find it at MIT Cooking. It's terrific. I always want to like balance this. I. You can't predict what's gonna be a viral hit in a recipe. You can know, we know basically, can't miss with chicken, can't miss with salmon, can't miss with bold colors. Um, but by the same token, I, I, wanna be, I wanna be able to take anything that one of our cooks or journalists thinks is amazing and proves out is amazing and figure out a way to photograph it in a way that is not um, cheap or derivative, right? So we have to think about that a, a lot, because otherwise we're all working for Instagram, which means we're all working for Zuckerberg. I love the idea of the Sunday suppers, but I'm curious as to how your children felt about them then when they presumably were somewhat younger and now when presumably they're considerably older. Well, they've been brainwashed. <laughs> so it was interesting. You'll see in this book I'm selling <laughs> that there's a moment and I wrote about this in an uh, adaptation, or an essay that I ran in the Times as an adaptation as part of the launch of this book that I'm selling. See you on Sunday, did I tell you about that? <laughs> about how the kids, what the kids' reaction was to being dragged off to a moldering parish hall in Greenpoint every Sunday for a couple of years. Um, they didn't want to be in the, they didn't want to go to an evening prayer service, they wanted to read uh, manga. They wanted to play with Polly Pockets. They didn't, they, it, this was not what they um, wanted. I knew, because it, had, it has happened to children for millennia when they're dragged off to places of worship, that some stuff would come in and maybe they'd actually be nicer as a result. But it was the dinner, and they were, but it was the dinners that mattered to me. And watching them flower not like big, huge flowers. This isn't a montage sequence. But watching them come out of their shells a little bit as, um, as a result of continual interaction with strangers or new people or different people, people of different backgrounds, of different experiences, people working programs, like having a, 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 a child, literally children in, in that, environment, I think um, really was ultimately quite um, good for them. And um, I was really touched when the older one said one night, wouldn't it be better if church was just dinner? <laughs> and, you know, that's a, you know, out of the mouths of babes. If you think about religious practice of any faith, like, and particularly the ones that see some kind of Eucharistic, there's food, there's wine, there is communion. Um, and so that was pretty wise. So I guess they turned, and they got into college. Uh, two related questions. One, as a food critic, do you get invited to people's homes for dinner very often? <laughs> uh, I sure do. People, I mean, they were like, oh, I'm so nervous to cook for you. 
I like good food, and people yeah. make good food. And you know where the best food in America is made? In people's homes. So I'm happy to do it. Uh, thank you. And related to that is going out to restaurants. I, I do, I've been doing a lot of speaking lately, so when I see a speaker, I have a different view of them, looking at their speaking style. Uh, you do very well, by the way. Thank you. Um, do you go to restaurants? Does it, is it harder for you to enjoy when you're out with your family or just not working? Let me tell you something. Being the former restaurant critic of the New York Times is like, it's like being Bill Clinton. Like, it is unbelievable. Like, I spent five, like four or five years with fake credit cards, eating at five o'clock in the afternoon, with my back to the, you know, like struggling, hoping not to get, listening to this lawyer ramble on to take focus away, just trying to taste the food again and again. Oh, I can only eat at 10.30, I got a terrible table, it's, this place is awful, actually it's pretty good. Like all of that stuff. And then you're the former restaurant critic and it's like, who's the reservation for? Uh, Sam Sifton from the New York Times and like now people are I'm known so people are really nice to me and I get not that I have no power anymore I can't do that but they know that I put in the time and that I care about food and that I'm like a guy who is thinks about this stuff and I get to do what was really hard to do when I was critic which is ask a lot of questions I'm a really curious person that's how you end up a journalist you want to ask a lot of questions and that's a real tell if you're trying to be an anonymous critic you know is this really arctic char where do you get your arctic char how long have you been working here do you have health insurance <laughs> so what is your favorite music to cook with Oh, so this is a, that's a really interesting question and it's, and it's one that's um, come up a number of times uh, this week, the inaugural week of See You on Sunday. <laughs> um, I suppose because I write about music a lot in, in uh, the newsletter for the Times. And what's interesting is how much the answer to that question has changed over the course of the last 10 or 15 years. When I started kind of cooking seriously for large groups, I would go over to a stack of compact discs and put them into the machine. And I was like, I like this Lyle Lovett character. <laughs> I, or, you know, I had, the, I had this Toots and the Maytals record that I would play and it would indicate that it was Sunday. Like, I'm, and it was great. But now, I don't know if you've encountered any of these streaming services. But these streaming services have changed this completely. And um, th they still have to kind of figure out how to modulate this so that musicians are actually paid and not paid pennies on the, on the dollar, um, but actually paid for, for their work because the, the ease of being able to explore this giant record shop of the internet is, is literally unparalleled in the history of, uh, of man. And, and, and so, to answer your question, like I like going into the streaming service, and I, I've been listening to a lot of like '70s Nigerian pop, <laughs> and like that's my jam for right now in the winter of 2020, which is the winter I release. See what's happening. Okay, one of the concepts that I've been following and reading about food is that of zero waste. I've read about a restaurant that has no garbage pickup because there is no garbage. And I'm just wondering that recycling was something that was not even thought about maybe, what, 30 years ago. And I'm just wondering what food writers are thinking about this and if there are going to be more articles about what to do with peel and pit and skin and oh, all of those delicious. other things that, that we've been throwing out. It's a great question. So. Um, <laughs> It, it's funny, the, the, the um, church should be dinner kid goes to a college where there is actually no garbage because they call garbage discarded resources. <laughs> it's not an inexpensive college. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so recycling wasn't really talked about 30 or 40 years ago because not everything 30 or 40 years ago came in a plastic bag. Not, you didn't get like a banana wrapped in saran wrap. Like it has a cover. Like what, have you seen that at the airport? Where it's a apple in plastic and, and everything in plastic, everything single use, everything terrible. That we gotta get a handle on for sure. And, and, and cities that are 
banning plastic bags, as New York has now done or will do on March 1st, is a step in that direction. Go, you know, going and here's to New York. Um, um, and, and as is like going to the place to get your growler of kombucha instead of buying the plastic um, thing. You should make your kombucha at home. There's a great recipe by me in <laughs> NYT cooking um, where, where you can get started, get started with that. But this question of what we're going to do, I don't know what we're going to do with the pits and the peels. I hope that um, if you have yards um, and have access to it, you can recycle. New York City has started an organic or a I guess they call it organics. It's not organic, but like where you can throw pits and peels uh, um, into a container and the, and the city comes and takes it away. Compost, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Um, I couldn't find it because I suspect they just put it in the landfill. They're training us. They're maybe training us against a behavior that they'll really jump in, into. I do think, that said, I do think that we are seeing in our readers a, um, a this will be a mixed metaphor, but a powerful thirst for recipes that take into account the fact that like, you don't want to end up with a lot of extra schmishma without a plan for it. And we're beginning to, to, to write recipes and, and to talk about that um, in, in real life. So you have your choice. Um, a, a slightly confrontational question or a forward-thinking question? <laughs> um, I'd be happy to sign it. Right? No. What? no. <laughs> That'll come later. No, I want, I want slightly confrontational. So you guys are the New York Times. You're not Bon Appetit or, and yet the pictures that you have with your recipes don't always correspond to your recipes at all. They're often done as styling. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to, i Just bring say, it. I, Punch me. <laughs> No, so uh, Yotam, uh, his, uh, his carrot recipe. Yeah, uh, with the carrot oil? The carrot top oil? Uh, it was supposed to be carrot top oil. His recipe says you strain all of the solids out of it, oh. and yet the picture has all these solids in it. <laughs> uh, because I know it's prettier. Yeah, yeah. So. And so, yet, okay. you're lying. Yeah, um, that's a great. So that's a. So that's a. That's a. That's a great question. I don't take it as confrontational at all. Um, although it is hilarious always to talk about Yotam Otolenghi recipes because I make all this stuff about it. Oh, it's just very simple and easy, and it's like one barberry and like. Um, as I recall, and I may be wrong, I don't want to sound defensive, but as I recall, I think you're supposed to hold back some of those um, carrot tops to dress. Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> For sure, you don't want to scrape the, the muck out and, and, and put it on the thing. You want that pure oil. Um, look, so the question of styling is one that obsesses me because you actually do need a stylist on set. Because otherwise, remember what I said about black and white? It's really kind of true. You'll end up with food that doesn't look like your food. Um, for a time, Martha Stewart was taking pictures of food and putting it on Instagram, and it was a horror show. She's a genius, but she can't take an iPhone picture to save her life. And th these were pictures at, at great, great restaurants, which because of the lighting or because of how she placed it weren't. Uh, coming out right. If I were to take the photographs of, of um, uh, the food in the New York Times, it would come out terribly because I'm also a terrible photographer. For See You on Sunday, um, and I'm not going to make a joke about you buying it because I know I said that before, um, <laughs> but um, these pictures, which were made by uh, David Malosh, the photographer, and Simon Andrews, the, uh, the stylist who works with him, I was so impressed with them because they actually look like the food that I make. Um, they just look like they're in a book rather than on, on my terrible iPhone feed. Now, I was up in their business about that, and our photo editors are on top of our uh, photographers and stylists uh, all the time, um, but we're producing you know, 25 recipes a, a week, and I can issue an edict like I'm Joseph Stalin, 
and still, when we're going through the pictures before publication, there's an artfully draped dish towel, which is the thing I hate the most in the world. <laughs> or, um, or, in the case of a Yotam recipe, it's almost too perfect. Because the thing about Yotam Odalenghi's recipes is I aspire to that life. I wish I was that guy. And when I make the, the, the recipes, and at the end of the 11th hour, when they're done, <laughs> they almost look that way. I'm almost good looking, but not quite. And, and so it's, we need to strike that balance. And I am here to admit to you in front of everyone that sometimes we fall short. As, as my late colleague David Carr said, sometimes it's not very good. When you close your eyes, whose kitchen do you go back to? And is that the same person who taught you that food is love and love is food, especially wow. on Sunday nights? Which I think you have a book coming out about. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow, what an amazing, I, I get a lot of questions. I haven't ever gotten that question and I love it. But <laughs> it's hard. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer a digression and see if I can get back onto, the, onto an answer. But the digression is that in every kitchen I've ever had, in terrible, grotty New York apartments, and I, for like a, a, literally 364 days, we lived in Rowayton, Connecticut, in the, in the most beautiful house I'll ever live in. It was like out of Cheever, but it had a terrible electric stove. And also it was in Rowayton, and where people are very, very nice, but they don't really talk about books, and, and it was a long way from the times, and we had to get out of there. They thought my wife was European. She's like from Rochester. <laughs> but... This, seriously, they said, you're from America? And she said, yeah, and they, uh, why? And they said, well, because of how you dress. <laughs> Put the sign up, ding, ding, open house, and we were gone. But I, but I, 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 lo but I, I loved Rowayton, it was beautiful. Um, but I loved that kitchen. I've loved all these kitchens, and, and I always fall in love with the stove. Even that, I said it was a terrible electric stove. I used to, it had a glass top, and I used to love at the end of the day, day on those Sundays, I used to love kind of scrubbing it down and getting it spotless. And I was like, that's like, if sh people who work in restaurants and, and do a lot of food preparation end up being very, they like to clean their station. They like to keep their stuff correct. That's me for sure. So I would fall in love with it. And then we'd go to another house and I'd fall in love with that stove, even despite its, its bulky qualities. And I suppose the answer to your question is, all of the kitchens that I grew up in. When I closed my eyes, it was like a kaleidoscope. I saw my grandmother's kitchen on Bailey Island, Maine, where, where she lived with her husband and my dad. I saw my other grandmother's kitchen in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I saw the, um, the uh, kitchen in the house that I grew up in before, um, you've all seen the squid and the whale. Um, <laughs> they got divorced, it's, it happens, this was the 70s. Um, uh, I, see, um, I see restaurant kitchens I've worked in. I, I see kitchens, there's a kitchen in, in Bennington, Vermont that be, uh, belongs to the parents of a friend of mine where I used to cook every Valentine's week uh, with the kids when they, we'd go skiing and I loved that kitchen. Terrible stove, but I loved it. So the truth of the matter is you find that love in the, in the kitchen and amazingly, even if your kitchen is terrible, it's gonna be there. You just gotta find it. There's a lot of pressure after that great question, and it's not such a good question. But one of my favorite parts of the newsletter is that it's not just recent recipes from that week. It's sort of from the whole archive. Yep. So, you know, I'm discovering recipes from however long, far back. What does that process look like? Are you just sort of sitting in the archives every day? Like so we have 20,000 recipes in the archive or in the database, and we're constantly trying to um, rejuvenate them to figure out the ones that um, really need ought to come back because we think people need to know about them. And sometimes it's really easy. Um, the plum tort of Marion Burroughs, do you know this? Yay. Okay, so this is a recipe that was published in the New York Times in like 1974 or 75. It proved so successful that the newspaper did something that it never 
had done. It published it again the next plum season, the next September. And it did that for like six years in a row. And then it did something that the gray lady I don't think has ever done since, which was it said, this is the last time we're publishing it. And, and it put a little dotted line around it with a little scissors emoji. <laughs> So that was like 1981, right? And I, some, I can't remember, it might have been Marion herself, somebody mentioned it, or my mom, somebody mentioned it to me. And I went back and I found that history and I thought, well, we got it. So we went out and styled it. She left on me, but we styled it beautifully. And it looks exactly like what it looks like because it's such a simple recipe. And then we put it up and bam, it was one of the top recipes of the year. Like, people love this thing. It's incredible. So that's what I'm looking for, are these moments. Um, I, I measure success at the New York Times. Um, if uh, I hear from someone that they went to the butcher shop or they went to the fishmonger or they went to the uh, greengrocer and there was no kohlrabi because we had a great kohlrabi recipe or there are no chicken thighs to be had and all of Topeka because of my <laughs> chicken thigh recipe. That's what we're trying to, to get, and I know that happened in the past, and when we can figure out that it happened in the past, we try to, 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 to bring it back. We work hard for your admiration. Um, thank you very much for coming.